Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome to this uh, special discussion of the Working Class Think Tank. My name is Dee Miles, and I'll be the moderator for this morning's special discussion. We're very uh, pleased to have two presenters who will help us navigate the uh, latest book by Reverend Dr. William Barber. The book is White Poverty, How Exposing Myths About Race and Class Can Reconstruct American Democracy. And this book was recently uh, released, uh, I think uh, during the summer of uh, 2024. And it seems very fitting given the political moment in our country that we're discussing uh, this book at this time. So before I turn the mic over to our first presenter, let me share with you one of our upcoming activities uh, in which you are, uh, to which you're invited to uh, participate, participate. Our next activity will be uh, a mini M-I-N-I -I class series on uh, dialectics, strategy, and the fight against fascism. This mini class series will begin Saturday, September 28th at 11 a.m. Eastern, and it will run that Saturday for one class, and then that Tuesday night and Thursday night for one class each, and the series will conclude Saturday, October 5th, starting at 11 a.m. with the last class of this series. So we, we invite you all to join us in um, this MINI -I mini class series concerning dialectics, strategy, and the fight against fascism running September 28th through October 5th. So with no further delay, I will turn the mic over to our first presenter, Scott. Good morning, comrades. Um, my name is Scott LeCastry. I'm a member of the Cleveland Club. I've been involved with the party for roughly three years now. I was going to delve right into it. Uh, white poverty, how exposing myths about race and class can reconstruct American democracy, written by Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II, President of Repairs of the Breach, founding director of the Center of Public Theology and Public Policy at Yale Divinity School. This book is one part autobiography and one part a study on the myth of poverty being mostly considered a black and brown issue. Dr. Barber believes we must redefine poverty in this country if we're ever going to get past the lies that keep us divided. We must dispel the, the myths that tell us people living in poverty are either lazy, flawed, or suffering the consequences of their own actions and understanding that poverty is a societal issue that affects everyone. There's three sections of the book, um, Facing Poverty, Myths, and Reconstructing Democracy. In the first part, uh, Facing Democracy, Dr. Barber starts off with some statistics. Despite growth in the GDP and gains in the stock market, real wealth for most Americans has steadily declined in the last 50 years. According to the official poverty measure, an individual who earns $14,000 a year or family of four that gets by on $28,000 aren't considered poor. Dr. Barber believes that the OPM is an outdated metric based on a relative cost of basic necessities in the 1960s with a budget of three times the cost of food. Well, costs have skyrocketed since then, with commodities like milk and eggs being four times what they cost then and housing being staggering 16 times what it costs. 19 million American renters are paying more than 30% of income on housing. 63% of workers today live check to check. The average American worker brings home $54 a week less than 50 years ago after adjusting for inflation. 85% of total wealth held in America is held by 20% of the people with 40% of Americans having no net worth at all. Dr. Barber believes a more accurate picture can be found by asking who would not be able to meet their monthly expenses if they had a $400 emergency this month. When looked at through this lens of practical necessity, 
which Dr. Barber uses in writing this book, 144 million Americans are poor and low income, with 66 million of those being white Americans. He starts, starts with a story of a woman who comes into his church for help with a light bill and how one of the other deacons instantly assumed that she didn't have a job and was simply looking for a handout. Dr. Barber came to understand in that moment, while his colleague was a good man at heart, he simply couldn't see the poor people he served in his church or understand what their lives were like. So this brings us to the concept of the watchman. The watchman is from the biblical myth of Jeremiah in the time of ancient Israel when leaders had forgotten their responsibility to the poor. Jeremiah said, from the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike, all practice deceit. Someone has to stand up and tell the truth. The watchman does not have power over policy or the ability to administer resources. The watchman commits to pay attention, and when they see something they know is a threat, they sound an alarm. Much like Jeremiah, Dr. Barber is haunted by the hidden poverty he's exposed to through his work with the church and the stories of the people he's come into contact with. And this led him to take up the mantle of the watchman and bring this problem to light. Dr. Barber believes that it is not that we have a lack of resources to fight poverty in America. What we lack is a matter of conscience, that most Americans can't see the scale of the problem and don't know how to talk about the ways growing inequality has impoverished our democracy. And we'll move on to uh, moral fusion. A moral fusion is the idea that the issues that impact poor people weren't matters of left versus right, but right versus wrong. They're moral issues. And at the same time, they were not disconnected. For one, one example he uses is how voter suppression targets black people. That it also hurts poor white people because it prevents politicians from getting elected who could pass policies that lift up all poor people. As president of the North Carolina NAACP in 2006, Dr. Barber started building a coalition of justice organizations working together to make North Carolina a place where everyone can thrive using this, this approach of moral fusion to some success. In 2008, they, they raised the minimum wage in North Carolina, so they had not been done in the South in quite some time. They were also able to expand voting rights and legislation that created 14 days of early voting. Those early votes made the difference in Obama winning at state. Things were going well for them until an influx of mystery money propped up a new class of reactionary politicians from the Tea Party machine, helping them win control of the state government. And that brings us to Moral Mondays. Moral Mondays began as a protest Dr. Barber organized in the North Carolina State House where he and others were arrested for speaking out against a bill designed to suppress voting rights that was quietly being pushed through on the day after Easter. The next Monday, they went back and were again arrested. This continued with the numbers of protesters growing from dozens to hundreds and from hundreds to thousands. The protest became a platform for people to share their stories and struggles. And out of this grows a movement with Moral Mondays spreading first in churches across the state then across the country. It's through these interactions and stories of shared struggles, Dr. Barber makes his case and dispels the myths about poverty in America and sheds light on the seemingly invisible millions of white Americans living in poverty and shows how these myths exist to hide the truth about poverty in America. The second section of the book is, is focuses on the myths themselves. The first myth is that pale skin is a shared interest. This myth implies a shared heritage, that because we are white, we have the same morals, views, and interests, which is ironic because the European culture where we all descend from is an extremely divided culture with multiple differences in language, customs, religious beliefs, and it's in some cases rampant with bigotry and xenophobia. Whiteness as a culture is an American concept. The second myth, only black folks want change in America. This myth says that all protests, activism, and any agitation for change are only for black people. It's a dangerous myth because it isolates black people's struggles from just for justice from the resistance to the extreme inequality that impacts most of us. The third myth, 
that poverty is only a black problem. Much like the previous myth, this also changes the narrative away from the common issue of class inequality and reframes it racially, making the issue itself seem smaller. Myth four, we cannot overcome division. This myth is meant to demoralize the movement and spread disillusionment. The focus is on cultural differences and away from the underlying shared economic issues. The third and final part of the book, uh, Reconstructing Democracy, the last section, uh, explains how only after dispelling these myths, exposing the real fundamental issues of poverty in America, can we begin to move towards true unity and common struggle. We shouldn't try to ignore or downplay the racial divisions of our past, but must study it unflinchingly in order to understand its causes and the effects it's had throughout our history, as well as the ways it still affects us today. Dr. Barber believes that once we can do that, we can repair the breaches between us and work together to build a truly unified movement against the forces working to keep us divided, powerless, and impoverished. To harness the collective voting power of millions upon millions of poor Americans currently not voting, and to build a diverse coalition with the strength to fight and win real policy changes to lift us all up from the bottom, to ultimately bring about what Dr. Barber calls the third reconstruction. I'm going to end this with a quote um, on page 32. But actually, technically, it's a a quote within a quote. So we'll start. We are in many ways a nation united by the shared suffering of a long train of abuses. But when I look into the faces of America's poor, I hear the words of Langston Hughes. I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek finding only the same old stupid plan of doggy dog mighty crush me. America was never America to me, Hughes cried out, representing the voice of America's poor in 1935 during the Great Depression that laid bare the myths of America's Gilded Age. The bard of the Harlem Renaissance gave voice to the Black experience that exposed the mile-wide gulf between America's promise and its practice, but he made clear that it wasn't just the experience of Black Americans. The solidarity of experience amongst America's poor produced the shared hope that Hughes taught us to sing. And yet, I swear this oath, he wrote, America will be. I, I would say the three main points of, of this book, in my opinion, would have to be the watchman, which is the concept of, of the person who, who cries out when they see you know, wrongs in society. Um, the second part being the moral fusion, um, the, the, the idea behind the building of the movement, of Moral Mondays, and ultimately um, dividing the breach. And, uh, and the third part being the, the spelling of the myths themselves. Uh, I'd like to leave you with, with two questions. The first one, how can Marxist analysis add to Dr. Barber's philosophy? And the second, as Marxist Leninists, do we agree that the problem is a lack of consciousness like Dr. Barber states? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Scott. And let me tell you, uh, Scott did not turn on his camera because uh, so that his voice would be clearer and we will uh, enable uh, his camera uh, as we get into the discussion um, period. Before we open the floor for discussion, we'll hear our next uh, presenter. All right, good morning, comrades. My name's Cameron. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, um, member of the party's labor commission, and uh, really excited to talk about this book. I think it's like Dee said, and um, thank you, Scott, for your opening presentation. I think it's really important and timely book, uh, especially having to navigate the crisis of democracy in the US. And I think it also points to a lot of things that are missing um, you know, from the corporate media and the major two parties talking about poverty, which they don't talk about enough, as well as uh, democracy. So I'm really thrilled about this book. I think it has some limitations, but there's a way that we can think about it as Marxist-Leninists to really use it 
and think more critically and deeply uh, and apply it to our party program and also um, how we view working class democracy. So the uh, the main things that I wanted to discuss with you all today is, you know, a lot of it um, Scott covered, which he did a really fantastic job of covering and, you know, the crisis of poverty, combating myth and building fusion coalitions. Um, the crisis we cannot see, um, kind of framing it as what the corporate media and the two major old parties don't really talk about is the, the horrible living conditions that people that make low wages and poverty have to exist under. 63% of US workers are living paycheck to paycheck and the average worker makes $54 less per week than 50 years ago. Real wages are lower than they were 50 years ago and 43% of our country is poor or low income. 66 million of these workers are white workers. However, there is still the, uh, the toxic influence of systemic racism and national and racial oppression that exists in the US capitalist system. 24 million black workers or 60% of all black people are poor or low wage. And there's similar statistics for Latinos and natives. This is driven by racist myths and the false consciousness that prevents the working class from uniting in a political coalition to ab abolish poverty for good. White poverty's wounds, which is in the, the dominant bourgeois narrative is kind of white poverty's thinking is it's an individual problem. You know, you're not working hard enough. You're not, you have to deal with it as an individual, but really it's part of the capitalist system in general. Wages are always kept low and productivity and profits keep skyrocketing. There's a bipartisan consensus that corporate profiteering and so-called freedom matters more than the lives of everyday Americans. Most poor people are, are in fact working and even working multiple jobs. And the vicious attacks on organized labor and voting rights have facilitated the rise of these neoliberal austerity politics. Again, there's a lot of racist myths that perpetuate the low wages too and prevent um, multiracial, multinational working class unity. White poverty is culturally forced on white people to bear alone or scapegoating others using myths on why it's happening in the first place. The so-called quote unquote white identity is in fact an ideological and a cultural tool for economic domination by the ruling class that not only uh, maintains the white supremacist uh, bourgeois narrative, but it also hurts white workers and as well as workers of all races. The racist wage gap drives down the bargaining power of workers and the standard living for all races and nationalities. The myths of uh, the, pair, the pale skin as being a shared interest is of course a myth. This white, the so-called white identity was in fact invented before the founding of the United States of America as a matter of law and policy in Virginia. The stories and myths of the so-called white race were invented to maintain the status quo for the landlords and ensure that all white people saw that their interests were aligned with the plantation owners and the major land owners. At its inception, it prevented the multiracial, multinational working class unity that was in its embryonic form. You know, um, albeit uh, African Americans or Africans at the time were in slavery, there were white people that were in indentured servitude, and there were beginnings to see how their interests could be aligned if they work together to repurpose the land and fight back against the major plantation owners. However, this concept of whiteness was maintained for ensuring that the massive profits of staple crops and the labor, which was both indentured servitude unpaid and slavery unpaid was maintained. This so-called white identity was used um, actually to kind of combine all of the intricacies of various European national customs with this idea of the Anglo-Saxon great English civilization, which had a shared culture of myth and fear. And they would use religion and um, 
great power chauvinism, like the great English civilization, and uh, also using it as like, this is God's master plan. Um, we have to conquer everything because we are the chosen people. And this is what God wants for us. Very reactionary, um, proto-fascistic type of thinking. And actually has a, this myth has a historical continuity in our country from the founding of the country through the civil war and the counter revolution after reconstruction. It has, Jim, it has its basis in Jim Crow and Nixon's Southern strategy, as well as today's MAGA movement, which, you know, as uh, Scott mentioned, kind of formed out of the Tea Party movement. Another myth is that only black folks want change in America. And this myth promotes division and disunity because it isolates the struggles against exploitation and oppression of black workers and black people from the fight against inequality that impacts all workers. Dr. Barber in the book said, you know, injustice impacts us all in different ways, but it still touches every single one of us. And the struggle for social progress in our country, you know, informally, of course, it's not like it's this formal um, thing, but it, the most effective struggles that have been for social progress have been rooted in a multiracial, multinational democratic movement. This myth reinforces the acceptance and the integration into the, so, the elite and the unequal economic system of capitalism and imperialism. It undermines the political and economic democracy that all working class people are striving for, whether consciously or unconsciously due to the contradictions of capitalism. This myth also uh, supports the white supremacist political violence that is used by and supported by the reactionary sections of you know, big business, the white supremacists, and it also impacts um, various sections of the white petty bourgeoisie and even the white working class. Lynching was used as an act of terrorism to decimate political coalitions after the Civil War and to dismantle Reconstruction on a, both an economic and cultural level. Today, they use racist dog whistles on popular policies such as redeeming America and taking our country back and making America great again. And what's interesting is a lot of these um, kind of slogans have been used during the counter revolution of reconstruction to Jim Crow, to the Southern strategy, to MAGA. These, these aren't new concepts or new slogans. They're actually been used for uh, over a hundred years now. And the, the point of it is to associate public policies that, that benefit working class people, such as higher taxes on corporations, supporting public schools, better labor laws, voting rights, and associating these with black people, black poverty, and to dismantle the gains of radical reconstruction. The myth that poverty is only a black people issue is used to basically institute what Barbara calls policy murder. The attack on voting rights and civil rights, of course, impacts black workers and workers of color at a disproportionate rate, but it does impact the standard living, the standard of living of all workers. And the corporate media promotes white supremacist myths and racist connotations of poverty that lead the public to believe that anti-poverty programs are in fact only for black people. And uh, an example he uses is um, during Ronald Reagan, there was every time they would show poverty, it would be a black woman surrounded by children and it would have this horrible white supremacist, racist uh, connotation of the quote unquote welfare queen. And he points to it that it's pretty different because during the Great Depression, a lot of poverty was used, especially with Dorothea Lange's uh, images of the, the Dust Bowl, where a lot of white farmers and white workers. But then, you know, moving forward throughout the 20th century, it became um, kind of propagandized as poverty is a Black people issue. And these myths circulate in times of acute economic crises. And the U.S. ruling class will repackage these myths in order to crush political coalitions and isolate individuals. Right now, um, following the uh, subprime mortgage crisis of 2008 and the crisis of the COVID pandemic, 
we're seeing these myths come up and the rise of you know the white supremacists and fascist forces trying to break up these political coalitions again i want to stress that they're not formal coalitions but they are um, embryonic in that when workers of various races and nationalities begin to see that their interests are aligned in opposing the capitalist class and opposing the wage cuts and inflation and the rampant price gouging they use these white supremacist myths to divide and conquer and make sure that maximum profits keep rolling in they like to promote the big business economics of freedom, but it's really only freedom for the corporations to be free from government regulation, to continue to exploit and oppress the American people. And they mix it with Christian nationalism. And it's, again, as Barbara stresses throughout the book, this is a centuries old propaganda campaign going all the way back to the uh, Virginia in the 17th century. A quote from Barbara that I think is worth sharing is um, the source of strife and division in our common life isn't simply political enemies that we can defeat at the ballot box. It's our collective abandonment of tens of millions of poor and working people. It's our failure to protect voting rights for all Americans and our neglect of children in communities where public schools have been hollowed out. And I think this is important because right now in the, the mainstream, you know, corporate media even on the more liberal side it's all about the middle class you know protecting the middle class way of life even this idea that unions built the middle class and it's really focusing on the upper echelon section what they mean by that is you know the upper echelon sections of the working class and small capital and while they are in crisis and it is hard for you know the so-called middle class or you know some working class people to buy a home to pay for mortgage and so on and so forth. What they neglect to say is the fact that a lot of working class people and poor and low wage workers are in fact not so much concerned about buying a home when they're having to pay for rent. Rent is skyrocketing. Grocery prices are skyrocketing. And like Scott said, a lot of people can't afford $400 in a time of, of emergency if their car breaks down or if, uh, some kind of crisis happens they don't have the money saved to be able to continue to go on without going into more and more debt and that's kind of something that's missing from the mainstream narrative around poverty the fusion coalition i think is really interesting it kind of reminded me of in our party program how we talk about the all people's front or even the concept of a united front but the idea of a fusion coalition at its root is many different single issue campaigns whether it's the environmental movement the labor movement the lgbtq movement the women's movement the movement for black liberation the movement for peace so on and so forth Instead of organizing and mobilizing on these single issues, if we combine them all together, we can form a large political coalition that can really begin to eradicate racism and poverty at its root. And as Marxists, we understand that to be the capitalist system. And to build a fusion coalition, we have to target the main issues that are facing poor and working people. We have to think about what are the main issues driving the movement of poor and low wage people. And we know that what these policies are that we can start to eradicate racism and poverty. We just have to organize the working class to do it. We also have to maintain the fight against racism because as, as he said, and as our party constantly maintains, it's not an issue of race or class, it's an issue of race and class. And white workers especially have a duty to combat racism and white chauvinism in their communities, in their workplaces, and even in their homes. We have to connect all the issues and build political power. Like I said earlier in my presentation, injustice touches us all in different ways, but it still touches us all. And every coalition that has pushed for progress in the history of our country has won its demands by building political power. It's not just uh, an issue of changing people's ideas. It's not just a subjective issue of thinking the right things. We actually have to organize and move people in struggle, right? That's the big thing 
that I took away from this book is his analysis is really calling us to get people engaged, whether in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, our communities, our friends and our family. We have to get people engaged in the process with all of the contradictions that exist in it and fight and uh, def not only defend our limited democracy, but push and expand democracy in every aspect of our lives. And when you lift from the bottom, everybody rises. That's the the Poor People's Campaign slogan. Um, and three things I would like for our viewers to take away from this book, whether you've read it or just watching our presentations, is we have to form the links between labor rights and voting rights. These are inseparable. You cannot only fight for labor rights and you cannot only fight for voting rights. They have to be tied together to have a truly mass movement democratic campaign. And mass movements are made by not individuals or leaders, but by the masses themselves, right? So he talks about the civil rights movement and the, the, the second reconstruction, where you know there were these great leaders such as Martin Luther King Jr., but oftentimes the real uh, movements were made by people that the history books don't even mention. You know, it could be a woman collecting petitions in her neighborhood or a trade union that's mobilizing people to for the March on Washington and getting people on buses to go to DC. These types of things, everybody contributing in their own way and contributing where they can in a mass way, right? Lenin would say politics is not in the hundreds or the thousands, but in the millions. It's these millions of working class people working together, doing what they can, that forms the mass movement that changes society. And that if we can mobilize these people and get them, get people to vote, ourselves included, in our own self-interest, right? Think of voting as a collective act and not some kind of moral act, that we can be the swing vote and really um, exert our class's political independence that way. Um, so that's kind of my presentation on it. When I think about um, th this book from a Marxist perspective, one of my critiques of Barber is that he thinks about things kind of through morality. And while you know that is valid, and I know he does come from the religious movement, as a Marxist, we understand this is not necessarily a moral question, right? The system isn't messed up because our morals are wrong. The system is messed up because it's inherent in capitalism for it to be wrong. Marx talks about the, the floor of what we allow to exist becomes the standard of lowering um, the standard of living for everybody, right? That floor that capitalism allows to exist, which he calls the socially necessary abstract labor time, that floor becomes what the capitalist class will use um, objectively to kind of lower and squeeze all working class people, right? And um, another thing that really came to mind is the Marx and Engels talked about the unemployed as the reserve army of labor and that capitalism requires people to be jobless because it drives down the bargaining power and the wages of all workers. And I was thinking, you know, um, during the re like last year when they're, the Fed was talking about inflation rates and, oh, you know, we need to maintain unemployment at at least 10 percent and then we'll drop it down a little and little and little and what that does is actually makes the the bargaining power of labor weaker and weaker by having unemployment and it helps the capitalist class when folks are unemployed because they could easily just be like oh okay you don't want to work for 725 an hour we can exploit an undocumented worker for two dollars an hour and we can go hire this person off the street for $3 an hour because they'll work. So what it does is it creates division and animosity between workers, but it also maintain, ensures that the highest profit margins are maintained and exploitation is ramped up. And uh, I'd be curious what folks have questions about or what they took from the book, but that's kind of uh, my thinking on it. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Dee. All right, we'll open, thank you, Cameron. We'll open the floor for discussion uh, now. So I'm looking for raised hands. Now, I would like to, as people are thinking about what they want to say, 
I would like to introduce a comment and a question. I thought that the most valuable, uh, and I should say we had another presenter who was scheduled, uh, a young uh, African-American woman, but she ran into a conflict and was unable to uh, join in a school conflict. Um, so I will uh, substitute a little bit. Now, the text in the book, one of the things I think the text uh, draws our attention to is the fact that um, the division that has been sown in this country uh, is not spontaneous. It is organized and it always has been organized and it's organized, it's initiated by the most powerful forces in this country. It's maintained by the most powerful forces in this country for the purpose of their maintaining their the status quo, their being in a position to maintain the status quo. And I would offer something a little bit different. Uh, initially, African-Americans were not uh, uh, fully enslaved. Many African Americans were uh, uh, here as indentured uh, servants, also, and the uh, and the um, use by the courts of per in Virginia of permanent enslavement was one of the first mechanisms used to create material difference based on race. Uh, I'm not a historian, but uh, I've read, and I think Barber's book substantiates the argument that um, only African Americans were de designated by the courts in Virginia as permanent, permanently enslaved as uh, punishment for running away, whatever. And uh, so this material difference all was used as a basis on which, as an early basis on which to sow di uh, division based on race. So the book contributes to helping us to understand that the division that exists is not a product of the desire of white people in general. It is a product of an approach to fomenting division coming from the most powerful sections of uh, the ruling class in our society. So my question is, how does our pushing that point today, that MAGA is also an organized effort coming from the most powerful sections of the ruling class in our country, even today, uh, how does that, how does uh, digesting that information help us to uh, further our engagement in fighting for social change? So I'm looking for hands. Okay, Laura. Yeah, hi. Um, I want to first thank Scott for giving a great summary of the book. I haven't, I've only read half of it, but you summarized it very well, the parts that I read and Cameron for the deep dive into it. Um, this I reacted very strongly to this book. It's an excellent book. I do agree with the analysis about the morality issue. To me, capitalism is immoral, but it's, it's almost beside the point. It's sort of like an add-on to the whole issue. But uh, just want to make a couple points, which was I really love the way Barber drew um, the line between oppression now and what went on during the ending of Reconstruction. He talks about um, how there was a hue and cry against taxes in the 18, late 60s, early 70s. And the reason they, the people in the South were, the white supremacists were arguing against taxes was because they had to build schools for, for African-American kids during the Reconstruction era. And so how do you get rid of those schools? You say, hey, they had to raise taxes. And so you say, okay, we're gonna get rid of taxes. So that hue and cry against taxes, is, which resonates today, is really a racist move. 
Um, and I think that even people who are anti-tax now, I see it as a very racist anti-people uh, um, proposal. Those schools that were built in the in the for poor people were not just for black kids; they're also for white kids because rural white kids, especially in the South, were not educated. So you know, there's there's a saying that there's nothing that black people want that white people don't want or need. And I think that was the case and back then. Um, and, I, and I think that um, it's just really interesting how he drew that line, that direct line. I really appreciate that. Another thing that, too, he talks about low-income people as a voting block. And I think that we have a perception that low-income people don't vote. And you have, there are statistics out there saying the voting rate is low. But there are also statistics showing, and this is on the Poor People's website, that I think in 2020, 35% of the, percent of the people who voted were low income. So I think that's a very significant statistic. And it tells us that we need to work with low income people. We need to get into low income communities if we are not already a part of those communities ourselves to get out the vote. And, you know, it's, you know, getting people simply engaged in voting itself can be a radical act, especially if you're people who have never voted. It could be a different, thing, um, a life-changing thing. Anyway, I think overall this book gives us some tools for talking to people. There's some excellent statistics, but it's not overladen with statistics. He does a great job in, you know, injecting his whole life story in there. But one statistic that just stands out is that 43% of people in this country are low income and poor. That is a shocking statistic. And of all the so-called developed nations, we have the highest poverty rate. If you take that, that statistic alone, tell people that, they, I would hope their jaw would drop and they say, wait a minute, I gotta look into this. Anyway, I think this book is a good tool, if, if imperfect. Um, I'm really glad that, um, thank you for holding this webinar, thanks. Thank you, uh, Laura. Looking for uh, more raised hands. Okay, Dan. Okay, uh, thank you for letting me speak. I, I know I'm in a Dunkin' Donuts and I didn't bring my earphones today, so it's kind of loud. And I'll try to talk loud. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, I, I have the book right here and I read the book. And I think it's very interesting philosophy, uh, morality, and uh, strategy for getting working people of all colors to work together. I, um, I come at this problem from a health perspective, I think. Food distribution in the poor white areas and the poor black areas is largely poor food, no fruits and vegetables, so people get sicker more diabetes, more heart disease, more dementia than in the white or black upper class areas. And uh, the party should talk more about health care, I think. But also, uh, there's much propaganda given to uh, food that's in the media and um, media, and so people don't think about healthcare very much. So I, my question is, how does healthcare fit into the political situation, the political movement that Barbara talks about? Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Looking for more raised hands. Emmanuel. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. My question is simple. Uh, there's a saying going around in this American campaign that there are black jobs. So when we talk about black jobs, is that racist? And if it is so, uh, how can we maneuver this to our advantage? Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Okay, Kay. Yeah, I guess my question is uh, similar, though a bit broader than the last one. Uh, just asking, how, if you've been out canvassing or talking to people on the picket line or things like that, how do points like these 
go over with the people that you're talking to. Because I feel like when I've gone out and talked to people about this or seen conversations go on, um, it, people kind of have this thought that maybe we're trying to erase the effects of race by bringing up that poverty affects everybody. And actually, if you do the numbers in the United States, there are just simply more white people that are in poverty than there are uh, people of color for any particular category that you look at. So how does this, um, what, what tips do you have for talking about this with people um, out in the struggle? That's all. Thank you, Kay. Uh, and uh, so now we will turn the mic uh, back over to our presenters but we will uh you will have one more opportunity to introduce your question or comment uh before we end this morning's uh special discussion of the working class think tank so we invite our panelists to respond to any comments or questions as you see fit for this round uh cameron you have the floor yeah uh thank you everybody for your comments and questions i'd like to address uh, Emmanuel's and Kay's comments specifically. To Emmanuel's point, the idea of so-called black jobs is absolutely racist. I think it instills the idea that um, there's a differentiation in labor between races. And I think that contributes to um, the division um, and also the these racist myths uh, going all the way back to you know the times of slavery and Jim Crow that um, you know, black people have to work the hardest jobs in the plants. Um, they have to, um, you know, work more domestic labor than white people. And these, these terrible, like racist connotations of like black jobs, I think is absolutely contributing to the, I guess, um, the kind of issues that Barbara's trying to get at with the idea of, um, black poverty being like a black people issue um and i think that there's a reason why you're hearing it from trump specifically this idea of black jobs and trying to uh, actually uh talking about how uh, migrant and immigrant workers are taking you know black jobs i think is trying to drive a wedge between um immigrant workers, undocumented workers, and black workers, but also just all workers in our country in general. So I think we should absolutely combat that narrative and not um, buy into this idea of dividing, uh, you know, working class labor power by race. And to Kay's point, um, I've been going to the, the, in Detroit, there's a, the marathon workers, the oil refinery workers are on strike and have been on strike now for two weeks. And uh, the shop is multiracial, multigendered. I think it encapsulates the working class of Detroit. Um, you know, like that, that, and at that shop is like a good example of what the working class in Detroit is looking like. And when you talk to the workers, they all understand that they're all struggling with poverty. That's why they're on strike. And they understand, um, you know, through their trade union consciousness that the poverty that they're being inflicted upon is not the cause of each other, not the cause of immigrants even, but the cause of the monopoly corporation marathon. So to them, they see the issue very clearly, um, whether or not who they're, who they're voting for, you know, on the picket line, they're all there for a single issue, and that's to get a good, fair contract that benefits everyone equally. So I think if we can constantly connect it to the monopoly bourgeoisie, the monopoly corporations such as Marathon that are exploiting the workers that, you know, make the plant run and profits rolling in in general, I think we would have a, a better chance at, you know, com combating the the idea that what's being erased and what's not being erased, because at the end of the day, on the picket line, they're all there withholding their labor together in unity to demand a fair contract that'll benefit all of them. So those would be my um, answers. I hope that they're helpful. I don't know if they're exactly right, but they are what I was immediately thinking. That's it. 
Scott, would you like to respond to uh, any of the comments or questions? Um, I, don't, I don't think I can really add much to what uh, what Cameron's answer was. Um, that, that I was going to address the same thing, but he uh, he pretty much nailed it. Okay. All right. So we'll take more. Uh, we're looking for more raised hands. We'll do another round of comments and questions before we finally turn it over to our panelists for responses and uh, and summary remarks and close down for the day. Uh, while I'm looking for raised hands, I'd like to raise uh, another question. And this question has to do with um, with this. Is Reverend uh, Dr. William Barber arguing for ignoring differences that exist based on experiences of exploitation and oppression? Or is he arguing for realizing that though we don't, uh, depending on if we're uh, of the indigenous population, maybe, or if we're of the Latino population, maybe, or if we're of the African-American population, maybe, or if we are women, or if we're uh, of the white section of the working class, uh, given that our experiences with exploitation and oppression may be different, um, is Reverend Barber arguing against uh, policy responses to difference that will attend to those differences uh, or uh, uh, at the for the sake of uh, common commonality, or is he arguing for uh, a basis of unity or a ground uh, grounding of unity in responding to uh, difference uh, the differences um, at this all at the same time? The point being. Um, should uh, the indigenous population expect uh, policy responses to their particular experience? Should African Americans expect po po policy responses to their particular experience? Uh, should Latinos expect policy responses to their particular experience? Should ordinary, should uh, the white section of the working class? Uh, expect policy responses to their particular experiences and the net effect being a uh, a solid basis for united uh, for unity uh, as it relates to uh, fighting back. So let's take more uh, questions and comments before I turn the mic back over to our presenters. Corey, your mic is open on our end. Hi there. I just wanted to emphasize um, the uh, the use of division as a tool by the ruling classes um, is a very it's a very powerful tool, and um, it can allow further manipulation of things like democratic process. When you have people in smaller groups, they're not cohesive. It's easier to use structural and cultural violence to further marginalize and alienate and 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 control. Um, smaller populations. So I just want us to all remember this and know that we have to we have to be uh, in, in in unison. Thank you, Corey. Looking for more raised hands. Okay, is that Shellen? Your mic is open on our end, please. There you are. Uh, yeah, I just I was wanted to respond to uh, the the question that Scott left us with after his. Um, presentation the question of is Reverend Barber right in pinning the issue on a lack of consciousness and I think it's it is he's right it, it's not the whole issue but it is a major issue and we have there's all kinds of pressures on the working class um, that that move against the, the like an ability to gain that consciousness whether it's media pressure or just the you know stress of having to spend most of your time working and not really being able to um, you know come into contact 
with whether it's just other organizers or um you know I, I think one of the things i like about reverend barber's approach is that he, he is a reverend and you know churches tend to be pretty pretty open open door kind of uh centers in the community and i i don't i don't really have a an answer but i i think it's kind of a, an open question of how how do we you know we in our party we focus on the collective which is so important um how do we continue to build that collective consciousness uh, and work against the the individualism that uh keeps kind of pushes people into these hopeless uh frames of mind that you know they're alone and there's no there's no way that they can uh, advocate for themselves or or anything like that Thank you, Shellen. Looking for more raised hands. Okay, John. Yeah, a comment uh, on uh, the divisiveness of uh, Jim Crow and so on that was said long ago, and then I want to sort of address uh, pulling together. Uh, Lou Harlan, who later in the 70s wrote biography of two volume biography booker t washington wrote a book on uh, education public education in the southeastern u.s during jim crow and he pointed out though the advocacy was i mean the the racist push was to separate black and white schools but the separation was greater in the sections of the states in the southeast U.S. that had wealth for whites was greater than uh, between them and poorer and working class whites than it was between poor and working class whites and blacks in terms of the amount spent on education. So it was a gaming thing all along. You know, you're with us. Well, you're not so much with us. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so that that division is a uh, tool to divide and conquer, just one education example. On the, uh, the many issues, different parts of the working class, racial divisions, uh, gender uh, and age and so on, uh, they all have to be addressed, but they all have to be uh, only can be addressed if you pull in that coalition, creating that coalition. Uh, I think that's the big challenge. You can't ignore anyone's and uh, nobody's going to come into a coalition if you're not dealing with their issues. But uh, you've got to find a way to pull everybody together, because if you don't have the coalition, you don't have power to do anything. Uh, that's that's what's facing us in this uh in this election again we've got to find uh ways to pull everybody in uh to deal with uh with the mega thank you thank you rolling through to looking for one more time looking for more um raised hands okay curtis your Mic is open on our end. Greetings. You know, with capitalism, the dis it's destroying the free market. And with cooperatives, they do have the potential to save the free market from capitalism's destruction of it. Because competition brings prices down. And collective ownership brings wages up. By taking advantage of the competition, we can eradicate white poverty alongside black poverty and everybody would win due to the leveled playing field okay curtis thank you for your comment and if our uh panelists so choose they might want to offer friendly uh suggestions of additional alternative approaches to solving the challenges we face today all right so i'm looking for one final time for raised hands. And I see no more raised hands. So let's turn it over for the last time to Scott and Cameron for their responses and their summary remarks. 
Scott, you have the floor. Oh uh, yeah, um, I believe that Slellen had made he made a reference to Jim Crow, and um, Barbara really does a, a good job in explaining um, the evolution of Jim Crow, um, going from how we, how we're no longer fighting, you know, the ignorant Jim Crow, you know that that was that was in the fifties and prior to that, but a new sleeker version. He was required. He refers to it as James Crow Esquire. Um, yeah, I mean it's a very good point. They 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 have changed tactics. They they are doing things much more more stylishly now. Um, it's more polished, but ultimately their goals are the same. Um, so I think we, that's something we need to recognize that. Uh, you know, even though the tactics of the reactionary right um shift from time to time, uh, depending on you know uh, the power they have, uh, to basically um just how things are going you know in society. Because we need to be, to be very vigilant and uh, and, and recognize you know, James Crow Esquire for for what he is, and never forget that he's still Jim Crow. Um, that's about all I have to add to that. Thank you, Scott, uh, and thank you for your participation in this um, in this uh, special discussion of the working class think tank. Uh, the mic is turned to you now, Cameron, for your responses to questions and comments as well as your summary remarks. Um, real quick, my summary is I think everyone in the party should engage with this text and see if you come up with things that are similar or different than us. Because um, I think it's, a, again, it's a really important text for us to be engaging with. And I want to respond to your question, D. I thought it was a provocative question. I don't know if you meant it to be provocative, but I want to kind of, go back in my point how it's not race or class, but it's race and class. And I think in only the only way to actually form unity, and I think John mentioned it too, is like you have to draw people into your coalition and there's still systemic issues that we have to address in forming this coalition, whether it's the unequal uh, wage gap between men and women workers, um, which means we have to raise the demand for equal pay for equal work to, to have a basis of unity on which to struggle. Additionally, uh, we have to address the systemic racism, you know, from the founding of the United States. And that means defending affirmative action and expanding affirmative action to, again, create that basis of unity. So I think you can do both. You can address the, the unifying policy decisions that, in, that uplift all workers while at the same time, you know, making sure that you're addressing the shortcomings and uplifting um, to rise everybody up to have the most uh, equal basis of unity on which to struggle, which means uh, combating racism and sexism and so on and so forth within the coalition, but also fighting for special policies that address these things as well to to make sure that your coalition is the most united and strongest it can be. Um, that's that's what I was thinking with that question, and that's what I'd like to end it on. Okay, so thank you to our panelists this morning. Just a reminder to our participants, um, the Poor People's Campaign is a way to become active in uh, activity. There is no requirement to speak of particular uh, candidates. There is the, re the ask of, in, uh, of engaging with people to encourage them to engage with the uh, political challenges of the particular moment. So it's a wonderful way to get out there and talk to people and work with people uh, concerning um, the, um, the political and electoral challenges that we face at this particular time. So if you're not active in your union or you're not active in your in some uh, through some other entity, please consider becoming active through uh, the Poor People's Campaign uh, to uh, engage uh, with building uh, the uh, uh, adequate response of a major section of the population, people who are low wage, people who are um, who are uh, unemployed, and people who are low wealth, which means that if you're not 
a if you're not of the uh, if you're not significantly wealthy, uh, there is a credible argument that you are on the side you are on this side of the uh, train tracks and we all have an interest in advancing uh, what is what will help uh, as Reverend Barber says lift from the bottom um, and it will have an impact on all of us. So thank you again for joining in. Remember this is a, a high activity moment and there is a need to encourage the involvement of everyone uh, in this moment and using their vote to uh, express their voice and their demands. Uh, um, so thank you again for joining us and we hope you will join us again going forward. Have a good day, everyone. And thank you to the panelists again. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Cameron. It was absolutely my pleasure, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Thank you. Thanks, Have a good Tom. day. Have a good day, everyone.